My name is Rhonda Vincent, and I'm the Director of Educational Training at Momentus Institute. And Tara, you want to um, introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Tara Becker. I'm a social worker, and in my role at Momentus, I partner with educators and administrators who are implementing social-emotional health in their schools. Absolutely. All right. So a little bit about who we are, um, again, for those of you who don't know us. Uh, Momentous Institute is a, a very old, it's 100 years old um, as of last year. We are a nonprofit organization in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have three arms of service. Uh, the first being Momentous School, which is our lab school. Um, can't wait for this um, COVID to be over for so many reasons, but also because one of the things we do is we welcome people into our lab school to tour and we learn with and from them. Um, and of course, those have been discontinued for the last year. So um, Momentous School is one of our areas of direct service. Therapeutic uh, services is another very important one. Uh, we have a long history in mental health and uh, serve between five and 6,000 youth and their and families um, every year. And then research and training is the, um, the wing that Tara and I work with. And um, obviously researching everything that we're doing just to see the efficacy of it and also uh, learning from what's out there. So we're both research contributors and research users. And then um, obviously we do things like this, which is training. So that's a little bit about who we are. And the mission of our agency is to really help uh, children develop and, um, and build and sometimes, sometimes repair their social emotional health so that they can really reach their full potential. We know that social emotional health is super important um, in school, uh, there's lots of research that shows the connection between um, academic success and uh, social emotional health skills, but we also know that it's an important thing for life. Uh, and if you noticed our um, on our wheel there with the three arms of service, kids are at the center. And so we're really here to make sure that kids do well, not just while we have them uh, for the nine months of the year, but also um, that their trajectory for life is a really positive one. And then uh, we've come up with a, a pretty distilled definition of social emotional health. We know there are lots of definitions out there, but we wanted something that was sticky that you could remember. And so we think of social emotional health as the ability to understand and manage your emotions, your reactions, and your relationships. Um, we use the term social emotional health to mean that it's this broad understanding and, and ability um, some of you may, may be more familiar with the term social emotional learning. We think those are the skill sets that you learn in order to get to this place. So um, that's our definition of social and emotional health. So to kind of ground our talk today around resilience, I wanted to ask each of you to take a few minutes and we are gonna do a quick write. I'd like you to write about a difficult situation that you went through in the past and how you got through it. Um, don't choose the hardest thing that you've ever been through. So not something that was really traumatic and not something that you might still be working through right now, but just try to think through something that was difficult. And I am going to uh, set a timer for about a minute and a half just to start writing through a difficult situation that you went through in the past and how you got through it. So go ahead, uh, grab a pen and paper if you don't have one and take a moment to do that. Thank you. 
go ahead and take about 30 more seconds to finish your thought. It's okay if you don't get finished, hopefully. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and bring you back. It's okay if you're not done, but hopefully that gave you a minute just to start jogging your memory. And next, I'd like to invite all of us to stop and take a deep breath. I know uh, it's almost the end of the week. This year has been really hard and just anytime we're kind of thinking back to a difficult situation, it can be really good to take a moment and reset uh, our nervous system. So go ahead and find a comfortable spot. Um, if you can take a seat, if you're not already seated, uh, you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable or just kind of look down and find a, a spot to gaze towards. You can check your shoulders and see if they're kind of hunched up tight and relax them. Maybe notice your jaw, if your jaw is locked. And then go ahead and just start to tune into the rhythm of your breathing. You don't have to change your breathing, just kind of notice your breath going in and out. I'm gonna do this for a moment together. And if you notice your mind start to wander, that's really natural and normal. Just kind of gently bring it back to your breath. And now go ahead and take a really deep breath in, really long exhale out, and then just kind of bring some movement back into your body. So hopefully that kind of brings you back uh, into the space today. So I know mindful breathing is a great way to, to build up your resilience too. So it's always a tool that we can use. And uh, before I unpack this slide, I forgot to tell you all that um, my background is in education. Tara's background is in mental health. She's a, a licensed um, master social worker. And um, right? Yep, you got it right. <laughs> There's a lot of acronyms in mental health. So it's really good. <laughs> a lot of letters behind the names, and I don't always get them right. So yay me. Um, and, and also, I wanted to tell you. Um, that while we got some questions ahead of time um, that we will definitely go over, we wanna make sure that you feel free to drop any questions that you have during the presentation into the chat. And Tara and I will take um, turns just monitoring that chat and we wanna make sure we get to all your questions. So um, what you see in front of you here is what we call at Momentus our stair step model, just because of the visual of it. This is a way for us to organize our thinking around a simple visual framework. And um, you can see there's all of these steps. There's um, six, uh, five steps there, pardon me. And the first one being safe relationships. What you notice about safe relationships is that it has all of the other colors in it, meaning that um, if you want somebody to understand others, which is the green color, you have to start with safe relationships. If you want somebody to self-regulate, you have to start with safe relationships. So as we talk about resilience today, which you can see is under awareness of self, um, remember that teaching this to kids and exercising it yourself cannot be done in the absence of safe relationships. And so we wanted to make sure that you knew that. Um, people with strong social emotional health really demonstrate that they have safe relationships and they know how to self-regulate and exercise self-control. They're always seeking to be more aware of themselves and of others. And they have really the healthy traits that we admire in our peers and in our colleagues. Um, and, and they're able to be change makers in their families and their society and their community, their school community, whatever it is. And so we wanted to share this with you as a way to help you know what our framework for thinking about the discrete skill sets um, in social emotional health, of which resilience is just one. Um, so I'm, go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, something in with you. <laughs> At Momentus, uh, we define resilience as the capacity to recover quickly from a failure or setback. 
And so resilience isn't something that's innate. It's something that we can all learn to grow and develop within ourselves. It's also something that is impacted by and we can experience in our communities and in our cultures, even in our classrooms, in a group as well. So when we talk about resilience, this is what we mean. And when we teach about social emotional health, social skills in general, uh, and especially resilience, we always wanna keep equity in mind, um, or rather the inequity that still exists in our classrooms and in our world. So we never want social emotional skills to be taught to children as a way to simply endure injustice. Rather, these are skills that all of us can use to come together and fight uh, systems of oppression. So how do we actually build resilience? So the first thing that we would wanna offer is that we build resilience when we build connections with other people. So how do we do this? As adults, we can prioritize the relationships in our lives. And in particular, you wanna prioritize the relationships that you have with people that really validate and affirm your experiences. So. We all have people in our lives that we love, but maybe we talk to them on the phone and after we get off, we feel more drained or we don't really feel heard. And so thinking about who is it in your life that really affirms how you think and feel and prioritizing the time that you have with those people. Uh, another way we can do this is by joining groups. So maybe uh, you'd like to join a religious organization or a civic group or a hobby. So if you have a hobby that you really love connecting with other people, who enjoy that as well. I know this has been really hard during the pandemic for all of us to connect with others, um, but I'm grateful for spaces like this where we can connect with each other in the ways that we can. How can children build connections between each other um, and with you in the classroom? A great way to do this is simply by starting with a morning meeting or closing circle if that's not something that you already do already. So providing just space and time for kids to get to know one another, uh, to share their experiences and feel heard. So building connection is one way that we can start. Another way is by practicing self-compassion. So you may have heard of self-compassion already. I think self-care is um, more familiar to people. So when you think about self-compassion, it's really about, so I want you to imagine that a friend comes to you after they've gone through something really difficult and challenging. Imagine how you would respond to that friend in the moment. You know, you're probably gonna hear them out. You're gonna treat them with kindness. You're not gonna judge them. And now I want you to think about how do you talk to or treat yourself when you go through something really hard? For many of us, we're not very kind to ourselves when we're going through, you know, a failure or a setback. And it's something that we have to learn to practice to really be kind to ourselves in those moments. Um, I presented on this really recently. And one of the participants shared with me, she was like, you know, I was always told growing up, treat others how, you know, you want to be treated. She's like, I'm having to practice that in the reverse. I need to treat myself how I treat other people. So practicing self-compassion is something that can really help us to develop our inner sense of resilience. This and can be tricky. Just, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's something. I, I wanted to jump in here just really quickly because um, I, you know, some of the kids that we usually pay a lot of attention to are the kids who um, are the least resilient. These are kids who really struggle uh, with relationships and all kinds of things. Um, and they tend not to be able to bounce back after a setback. And this is probably the first, um, after safe relationships, I would say this is the first way to dive in because they typically have a very negative um, script running through their heads like Tara was talking about. So um, you know, this, this just happened to me very personally today. My daughter, who's an A&M student, um, called me just in tears and she's all upset because she's taking five classes and she's working part-time and she's got one class that's really hard. And, um, you know, she said, I just feel so lazy. And I'm like, okay, so what's your evidence that you're lazy? So give me the evidence here. So she's, so she's a young adult. Um, and so it was very quiet on the phone. And of course, you're going to talk to kids a little bit different. But in order to change that script, we've got to give them some information. And um, 
and like I said, what I find is a lot of times people who are the least resilient often have a very negative script going through their through their heads. So, yeah, I and I think that's when we support kids. I love that story about your daughter <laughs> and a good therapist question. <laughs> but I think practicing self talk with kids, especially your really little kids. And even some of your older ones, like giving them phrases that they can use, like, it's okay if I make mistakes, like, I'm strong, I can get through this, just kind of giving those phrases to them so that they can start practicing is a good way to start. Mm -hmm. So being proactive. Um, this is another way to really kind of dive in. When somebody has a setback, one of the things that they first experience is um, you know, I'm overwhelmed or I, if for a kid, it might be, I'm in meltdown. Um, and that's because when you're in the midst of trouble, everything seems huge. And so we tend to focus on aspects that are beyond our control rather than focusing on what we can control. We tend to focus on what we can't control. So my daughter is a great example. She just was telling me everything that was going on in her life rather than thinking about what's the next best thing I could do. So um, kids need support in doing this. And so in order to build resilience, it's really important to zero in on those opportunities that we um, can present to them to be proactive. And, and what this really means is that you're gonna have to uncover aspects of a situation that the child can control, or if this is for you, if that you can control and work on those areas specifically. So no matter what the situation is, there are a few things that are constant that we can always, always control. The first one is our attitude. So, um, and, and you know, we all have bad attitudes at times, you know, don't beat yourself up. It's just part of being human. We all say things we regret and uh, respond in anger. But when you get to the point where you go, okay, that, that was not the right way to respond, then you can kind of reset a little bit and go, okay, what attitude can I reasonably um, approach this situation with? Um, and so controlling for your attitude is one way to be proactive. Um, and then once you get your control of your attitude, you can really think about your response. And when I mean response, um, I don't just mean the words that you say or the behavior you give, but also what's the nature of your response? What's, what's the intent of the response? So a response might be verbal, it might be nonverbal. That's nature of response. Um, and then think about what do I intend with this response so that if it doesn't work, you can think about, okay, well, my intent was to do this. How can I do that differently? And then the other thing about response is what is the speed of your response? So everything doesn't have to be responded to in, in a nanosecond. So being proactive sometimes, mean, sometimes means just sitting back and going, okay, I am going to respond to this. I'm going to get calm first. I'm going to think about, you know, how am I going to approach this with my attitude? And then what's a reasonable response and when will it best be given? Um, as a longtime teacher, I know sometimes we escalate um, negative emotions in children who are overwhelmed and melting down by responding immediately. Um, if the child is safe and the child is not uh, harming other people, then it's fine to go, I know you're having a moment here. I know this is hard. I'm going to give you a minute just to calm down. If you want to put your head down, that's fine and rest. And I'm going to circle back and check on you. So that would be sort of a delayed response. And your intent there was to get them to a, a sense of calm. Uh, think about your words and also, more importantly, the tone of your words. So what you can always control that. And then you can always control your body. So how do you position yourself? What do you do with your nonverbals? For kids, um, you know, it, Understandably, they're more easily overwhelmed than adults, and um, this is completely developmental. They should be. Uh, if you know anything about Momentus or you've been following us a while, you might have seen our, you know, flip the lid um, gesture that we get from uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, which basically means, you know, you flip your lid and your amygdala, which is your feeling part of the brain, is doing all of the thinking, and your thinking part of the brain is kind of uh, not connected. And so, um, you can't make good choices when you're like this. For adults who have a well-developed brain, they should not flip their lids 20 times a day. Kids though, it is developmentally appropriate for them to flip their lids multiple times a day. It's just part of development. Um, and so it's really important to think about, um, you know, why kids get overwhelmed. And if you remember that, it will help you to 
guide them to being more proactive in terms of um, developing resilience. One of the things in terms of development is kids um, cannot compartmentalize their, their self-concept. So while you and I as adults can compartmentalize um, you know, how we see ourselves, kids really see things very globally. So if you, um, you know, tell a kindergartner, oh, you're really a good artist, he can think about that as I'm a really good person. <laughs> And then, um, you know, if you look at the opposite of that, a kid who encounters a situation that might be overwhelming, like um, simply an art, you know, an argument with a friend or something like that, she might jump to some sort of generalized sense of self that says, nobody likes me, or I have no friends, or everyone's mean to me. Um, this is one of the reasons why kids melt down over things that seem pretty trivial to adults. So bouncing back from those global internal messages can be difficult. And this is where you could be proactive and help children by giving them some of this information. So saying things like, you know, right now um, I can see you're, you're having a problem with a friend and you feel pretty sad. And, you know, sad comes and sad goes. It doesn't stay forever. So giving them that little bit of information, um, maybe, you know, friends get along and friends disagree. Let's talk about how you can fix this problem and feel better. So it's really important to, um, help kids figure out how to be proactive. So once you get them in that type of conversation, you can say things like, um, you know, in your own head, you're thinking, how do I break this down into tasks? So when you ask a child, so maybe can we talk about how we can make this better with your friend? Um, you know, she might say, well, I could apologize. And you might think in your head, okay, what should we do first? Should we go over to your friend? and um, ask her if you could talk to her. Maybe that would be the first thing to do. Make sure she's ready to hear your apology. And maybe um, let's you and I practice your apology. What do you think you're gonna apologize for? And then maybe you're gonna say to your friend what the apology is, and then maybe you'll um, give the, your friend a hug or a handshake or a high five or something like that. So figuring out how your support's really valuable right here will, will go a long way. Um, so we're going to talk about rewriting your story. You know, Tara started off with giving you a quick write. So how, you know, think about something that happened that was uncomfortable. And so um, sometimes when we look back on an uncomfortable um, circumstance, we often get stuck on the painful emotions that that circumstance brought up. So like hurt, frustration, embarrassment, whatever the situation brought up for you. So every time you call the situation to mind, you might think about the experience how you um, experienced and even cause yourself to re-experience those negative emotions. So without dismissing the reality of those emotions, we want you to put yourself in the, the position of rewriting the story of your difficult circumstance by focusing on the strengths, the per your personal strengths and what you learned uh, from the circumstance. So every difficult circumstance offers opportunities to focus on our strengths and these are characteristics or qualities that um, we can use to resolve a problem or to reset. And, and you need both of those things in order to bounce back when you encounter chaos or crisis. Um, for kids you know, who are still building self-awareness and, and they don't have lots of insight, they need to identify their strengths. And so take opportunities to tell kids what their strengths are. Now my caveat here is it's best to do that in private and authentic ways that are contingent on what you really see. So one of the, the things I, I fell into as a new teacher and I see it a lot is where a teacher will say something like, well, yeah, you can do this math that, you know, I, I, you, I believe in you, you're super smart. If you've never seen a child do that math, then you really should not say, I know you can do this because there's no evidence for that. So you might say something like, I've seen you do hard things before. Like I saw you go across that jungle gym um, and you were so fast. That's a hard thing to do. You have to have a lot of strength. I've seen you really stick with something hard. This is a hard problem and I know you can stick with it. So telling them um, real authentic information that's contingent on what you know about the child is super important. And it's really important to be authentic because kids have a huge baloney filter. And so if you're saying something that's totally baloney, they'll see right through it. And you kind of move them a step backwards in building this sort of resilience muscle. 
Yeah, I love Rhonda what you said about part of that authenticity is not dismissing that the things that we've gone through or that kids have gone through are um, are not difficult or painful. So it's really about holding both of those things at the same time. Like I've gone through something really challenging and painful, but through it, I did have, you know, some qualities that helped me to get to the other side. Right, right. So this uh, next slide here, I'm, I'm putting this into the chat right now. Um, we want to give you time to actually, um, whoops, sorry. Pardon me for one second. Okay. Can't do two things and talk, um, or actually one thing and talk, which is probably not good for my position here. But in any case, <laughs> we wanted to give you some some practice in rewriting your story. Um, oh, and here's a question here that might be important to everybody. Uh, Roxana is asking, so for rewriting your story, you mentioned two things. Think of your strength and what was the second? Um, oops, so I'm having trouble with my screen right here. No, it's okay. I think. Um, the palette that Rhonda just dropped into um, the chat is going to have four things for you to look at. And I think those are four things that you could look at with yourself or with kids. But I don't know if there's more, if you want to go back yeah. to what you said before. Sure. No. So, Roxanne, let me let me answer your question really quickly. So um, we want you to think about your your um, qualities and characteristics and um, think about how that those what you learned in those experiences. So what lessons did, did that hard experience help you to learn? So that's pretty much, uh, I hope that answers that question. Okay, so um, if you have your phone and you just pressed on this, uh, you took a picture of this QR code, it will take you to a Padlet. Um, if you don't wanna take a, a picture of that, I've dropped the um, Padlet into the um, chat box. And if you just paste it in your browser um, and, you know, link to that, what you'll find is a um, is a Padlet with four questions on it. And I've already populated those questions. I want you just to take a minute or two and I want you to think about the situation that you described and then answer each one of those questions um, as, as best as you can. And it'll populate one answer and then another answer. So you don't have to worry about where you're placing it. You just kind of click and type. Um, but we're going to be looking at that together. So let me hush a minute and give you about two minutes to think of those questions and how you'll answer them. And Rhonda, I'll stop sharing so that you can share that screen if you'd like. Can you see that, Tara? Perfect. Yeah, that looks great. Thanks. Everybody is already starting. Take about one more minute.
All right. So let's process a little bit. I, I This is on the screen so everybody can see it. Thank you so much for adding um, your, your own input here. And I can see a, a lot of commonalities. Um, and I also can see um, that you're able to recognize not just what you learned, but how you were strong in that situation and who you relied on. Um, so these are simple questions that you might be thinking about when, you know, teaching is a hard job. Being an educator in mm -hmm. any <laughs> capacity, whether you're a counselor, just working in, in the school environment is taxing. And so you need some resilience uh, and you've exercised it to this whole COVID situation. And here, now that we're please coming to the end of it, I think some of our resilience is getting a little bit low. So um, you might wanna think about these questions when you find yourself faced with um, those feelings of overwhelm and burnout and I just can't do this another day. Um, how do you bounce back? And then also, you know, how, how can this help you to uh, work with your kids and help them to, to build this muscle, uh, which is really what resilience is. If we never struggled, we'd never have a strong resilience muscle. So it's not that we want to avoid all of the struggles in life. We want to approach them in a way that benefits us long term. So I'm going to stop sharing. And again, thank you for that. And I think we can go to questions. Um, let's see. Thank you. I'm just echoing what Rhonda already said, but thanks for sharing those powerful reflections with us. I think it's always a good reminder when we go through something new and difficult to remember that we, we've been here, maybe not this exact same place, but we've been through hard things before and we can do it again. Absolutely. So are we going to do, oh, when we're going to do questions first, you were going to say when to ask for help. I'm sorry. I'm yes. Kidding. No, I, I, I'll come back to this at the end. Okay. You can do this. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and take some questions. So uh, there were three really good questions that were asked yesterday. Um, the first one was, or given to us by email, the first one was, how do you teach resilience to students who don't really deal with struggle <laughs> because parents don't let them? Which, um, according to this questioner, um, is a sort of a, a common thing in private schools. So I, I just love that question. Um, it makes me feel very sorry for a lot of kids. Um, I kind of answered it a little bit already when I said we don't want to avoid struggle uh, because then we don't get strong at being resilient. Um, I think it's important to, and I so I also want to say, I think most parents who do this are doing it from the right, um, from the heart. They're really trying to protect their kids and they really want, want to see their kids happy and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I think that's, you know, laudable. Most of us, uh, most parents just love their kids beyond what is reasonable. So we can't um, kind of pick on parents for, for shielding their kids a little bit too much. But I think it's really important, especially in school, maybe you have a consequence for a kid that the parent comes up and they're saying, well, I don't want Jimmy to have to, um, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever the consequence might be. I don't think that's fair. And um, it's really, really hurt his feelings and blah, blah, blah. And he won't do it anymore. Then I think you have an opportunity to have a conversation that you wouldn't have had an opportunity to before. And you can talk about um, what is your intent for the consequence? And how does that match what the parent wants for the child? So as you see your child as an adult, how do you want your child to embrace things that are um, difficult? And so, um, you know, if they want, most parents will say, I want my child to be able to face a challenge and do great things and um, achieve wonderful things. And I think that's your cue to steer them back in the conversation to, in order to get your child here, they've got to go through some toughness early on. And so it's better for us to go through them with that toughness in a sheltered kind of way, in a, with people who love them, rather than waiting until they're 18 or 19 or 26 and sending them out into the world and having the world just be really, um, worldly <laughs> and really hard on them. So yeah, I think this is not a kid question. This is more of a parent deal. 
So if you know you're at a private school and this is going to happen, maybe outlining with, and I'm spitballing here, this might not be the right answer, but I'm thinking outlining what, well, here's one thing, and this is not spitballing, something we do at Momentous School is we ask parents to fill out a vision statement for their kids at the beginning of the year. And basically that vision statement asks the parent to think about what do you want for your child as an adult? What do you want them to believe in? What do you want them to be proud of? Um, what do you hope that they achieve? And then we take that as a roadmap for how we work together, um, teacher and parent. And if you're interested, I'm happy to share um, the, uh, the template for this. And then you can go back and say, you know, I read this really um, carefully, what you wanted for your child and saving him from the consequences right now is how do you think that's going to work out to get him to where you want him to be? So uh, I think it was Roxanne who said, yes, please share. Um, I'll make sure it's sent out in the follow up um, uh, email. Tara, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I actually asked uh, this question because we saw it ahead of time um, to one of the educators that we work with. And, you know, something that she recommended was in her, she's had this experience before with kids in her classroom. Um, and she was sharing that with all kids, but especially with kids who don't have practice at resilience, just really when you're in the classroom, you know, making really, really tiny, small incremental steps towards practicing failure. Because usually kids are gonna run into, you know, maybe some failure on a test or, you know, an experience where they struggle with a friend, but really kind of helping them build up that resilience muscle in really small ways. Um, another thing that she tried was uh, in her closing circle with students at the end of the day was to ask the question, what today was a growing experience for you? And you could kind of change that language depending on your grade level. But I think just getting kids into the habit or mindset that growing um, and struggling is a normal part of life and having them practice thinking about what is a struggle for them can be really helpful for them to start to start working on resilience. Was that the second question that you're looking at? So what are some authentic situations? So we're so sorry. No, that's okay. Just just for um like for kids who haven't experienced okay. um or, you know, if they're in a school or they're in a situation with their family where they're really being protected from that experience of failure, just starting really small with practicing it in the classroom is a way that you can support as a teacher and by helping them think intentionally um, in a space like a closing circle or a reflection about how they're growing mm -hmm. um, and learning. Um, before we tackle the next question, um, Roxana, you're asking, are there any books you recommend on teaching, encouraging resilience for high school teachers? Are you talking about high school, so high school teachers encouraging it for their students or for themselves? I'm imagining you're thinking about how, as a high school teacher, it's for the students. Okay, yes, for students, thank you. So um, I don't know of any books specifically about resilience, but my go-to recommendation for every high school teacher is, um, Brainstorm by Dr. Dan Siegel, because, you know, resilience happens in the brain. It's the way the brain processes information and interprets a situation. And that book, uh, Brainstorm by Dr. Dan Siegel, is so illuminating um, for the either middle school or high school kids, because it really helps you to understand the way that they think. So I would definitely start there. I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, Tara, do you? I don't for high school, but if I think of any, we can absolutely include that when we follow up, but I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, the second question, um, I think some of the answers that you gave, Tara, will um, oh, would apply. This one, so that's, that's fine. We can share answers. Um, they, they span across multiple questions, but the question here is, um, what are authentic situations to create for students mm. to help them practice resiliency without making them feel defeated or unmotivated? is a perfect question. So mm -hmm. my my answer to that is, um, I got, I've got a lot of thoughts about it, but my answer is the easiest thing to do is to model resilience. So, um, you know, um, Tara just mentioned kind of normalizing the stress of being overwhelmed and of failing. And I think that's one of the most important things you can do is normalize that we all fail. And then you have an opportunity to 
show them how you um, bounce back. So let's say you're, you know, you're doing a lesson and we've all had this experience where it totally falls apart and, you know, something happens and, or you realize you've lost your place or you realize you don't know what you're teaching, which has happened to me before. Um, I think it's great to say, you know what, I'm really stuck right now. And this feels awful as a teacher. I should really know how to do this, but truthfully, I don't. And so I'm going to take a minute, take a breath, and I'm going to get back to this lesson and we're going to do it tomorrow. So I'm going to really make sure I know it by tomorrow or whatever the situation is, but show them how to be resilient. The other thing is, um, and I'm not, I'm really not trying to sell anything, but um, at our e-store, we have a, a thing called flip the clip. And it is our answer to a behavior management system, which is, you know, the clip chart where you have everybody has a clothespin and they move it down. Um, our flip the clip is uh, the reverse of that. So rather than looking at kids doing the wrong thing, we're looking at kids doing the right thing and we're having them track on that behavior. And so the reason I'm thinking about that is uh, one of the, we have these cards with a teeny little, like a one minute lesson on the back of it. Um, and one of the cards is resilience and it explains what it is in child friendly language. And then you give every kid their clothespin and you say, when you get the chance to practice resilience today, would you put your clip on that card? And then at the end of the day, like you're having a closing circle, you can say, hey, I see uh, Jimmy, you put your, um, your clip on there. Can you tell us how you practice resilience? So it's a way of normalizing and teaching it. So model, normalize, teach, that's what I would say. Tara, anything you want to add? No, that was great. I, I think that that makes a lot of sense for kiddos. Perfect. And then um, this, this question is, uh, I've got some of a repeat. How do you build resilience? What are activities mm -hmm. or strategies? So um, I'm just trying to think um, of the actual I'm, strategy. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, books and, and movies are great, too, like to show kids, like without them having to actually experience, you know, that struggle, but to, to watch or to hear about a character and kind of explore that as a classroom. That's always something yeah. you can do for resilience. Yeah, and I think children's literature is so strong here because mm. it, it removes the personal aspect of failure. And you can look at a character and say, ah. Oh, that must have been really hard. How do you think that ch character's feeling? Which is what good teachers do anyway, uh, particularly in elementary school when you're trying to teach kids about character motivation and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then say, you know, a couple chapters later, the, the situation will have changed for that character and stop and say, hmm, so I'm noticing something different here. This child, th this character really bounced back. He had a really hard setback and he bounced back. That's called resilience. What do you think about that? How did he do that? What were some strategies? So I think children's literature is really powerful. And um, we actually have a book list that I'll make sure and I send this along with the vision statement that has a whole bunch of children's books on resilience. And so that might help you to kind of navigate um, some bookstores. All right. Any other any, questions? Yeah. Any other questions that you all are thinking of right now? Um, another thing I can I would say is um, while while you're thinking of other questions is um, practicing resilience in a game based way. So mm -hmm. think of um, some games that you could play that are super challenging or that maybe the challenge builds over time and it gets harder as you go. And then talk about you know once things fall apart, then talk about hmm how do we get back on track. What, what do we tell ourselves to get back on track? So a really easy one would be um, pass the bell, which really teaches kids focus. So basically you put them in a, a circle, you have a little bell and you ask them to pass it around to each, you know, each person passes to the next and they try not to ring the bell. And then you try to make it faster. And, you know, eventually somebody will ring the bell and, say, and then everybody groans like, ah, oh, you know, so that's okay. This was hard, we've got all the way around, now we're gonna try it again. So and then at the end of that, you can talk about, okay, we, we failed a few times, how did that feel? And then how do we get back on the, get back on the horse or you know, however you wanna word that. But it's really about how did you regroup? Cause that's what resilience really is. 
So I see here, uh, Marie Claire. Um, yeah, Terry, you want to take that? Sure. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I, I no. you. Sorry, I'm not as good. <laughs> no, I, I hope you don't mind, Marie Claire. No, because it's a really great question. Okay, it's okay. It's good. I just wanted to ask just the case. Um, so I'm going to share her question that she sent to us. It says, sometimes the challenge is the level of educator stress and educators struggling with resilience, especially when they have students with higher needs. Do you have ideas for supporting educator resilience? Um, and sometimes because that's the trigger for big behaviors in the classroom. Absolutely. I think this is such an important question. Um, I think a lot of the, the ideas that we kind of went through today, so connection, self-compassion, those are ideas that really um, not only are they needing to be built into the classroom culture, but the school culture from the administration to teachers um, and between teachers. So how can um, schools provide opportunities for teachers to connect with uh, one another? Um, is there an environment in the school that says making mistakes is okay? I know that's a really hard one, um, but think, just kind of thinking about that question um, can be important for helping to relieve some teacher stress. And I think, um, Rhonda, jump in with more thoughts, but I think really connecting to teachers themselves to see what they need, you know, what, what do they speak to say is really important for them and helping to reduce their stress level so that they can practice resilience and, and be uh, more regulated for kids in the classroom. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, one thing that's really important, and I, I wish this call were filled with a bunch of um, admin people as well, because what I'm mm -hmm. gonna say is really geared more toward, toward administrators. But I think um, Tara is spot on with her understanding and um, her kind of move toward let's connect. Um, teachers will connect anyway. Um, you know, they'll go to each other's classrooms after school and it can turn into a big gripe session. At least this was my experience. So um, maybe that's not everybody's experience, but because, um, because teaching is hard work and nobody gets that, like a fellow teacher, we tend to kind of get together after school and go, oh my gosh, did you see that parent walk down the hall and whose class was she going to? And you know, um, this kid really is on my last nerve. And you kind of say things that you're just kind of blowing off steam and venting. Um, which is not a bad thing, but it's not a helpful thing, at least in the long term. And it's not helpful to stay in that spot. So administrators, if you can figure out a way to take the energy that teachers are building up and having an outlet for that, which feels more collaborative and feels more goal focused. So one, I had um, worked with a principal one time who had a wonderful practice and it was called Gripe to a goal. And basically what that meant was she was leaving space for a gripe session and it was okay, you're all welcome to get in on it and your gripes are valid. But before we start that gripe, we wanna come up with what is our goal? What do we really want? Uh, you know, we'll talk all around the problem and the aspects of it, but what do we really want to happen? So it might be, I need more time to teach or I need more control over who visits my classroom or interruptions, whatever it is. Um, I need more support with kids who are high need. That's the goal. And then you go backward and you gripe a little bit. Um, and what's amazing is what I found was that at first the griping starts and then people start thinking about that goal and thinking about, well, here's what I think should really happen in order for us to address this. Um, teachers go into this for the exact, most teachers I think just go into teaching for the right reason, but the job is difficult. It, it's sufficiently difficult to really get them discouraged pretty darn early. And so I think um, this sense of connection in a meaningful way with people who get it and want to continue doing good work is important. Um, the second thing I would say is, and it's backwards of what I said earlier, which was, you know, when you get overwhelmed, you look at the whole thing and so let's, let's narrow down. I think sometimes teachers need to look broadly and we tend to look just at my 26 kids and this six weeks and this kid. And really, I think pulling back and going, you know what? I am one teacher 
in one grade level for this child who's really struggling and I can do this much. My responsibility is not to change that child's life. Um, if you're a person of faith, you might think, you know, maybe, um, you know, higher powers will put um, the right people in that child's path from beyond you. Um, and you can have faith in that. Um, but you know, this child will encounter many, many teachers over the course of time. You are definitely responsible for what you can do during that time. But sometimes we borrow too much and say, the kid's not gonna pass the STAR test and then he's gonna go to tutoring and our mom will take him and I'm gonna live that. I mean, you take on too much. Um, we are not farmers. We don't get to plant water weed and so within the nine month of a, nine, nine months of a school year we get to do one of those things um, but we don't do all of them so track on what your responsibility really is so that you're not caring so much I think with that what you what you said Rhonda made me think about if there are opportunities too in the school to help teachers to help each other to carry that. And so especially with kiddos who are struggling with really big behaviors, like, is there a team, you know, that the, that the teacher can count on? Because there's nothing more, um, nothing more of an obstacle to resilience than feeling like the loneliness or that you're in this alone. And so kind of holding both of those things that you are, there's only so much you can do by yourself and how can you um, tap into a bigger network of support to, to handle whatever challenges you're facing in the classroom or if you're struggling with a particular student? Like, is there, are there multiple people, a team approach to supporting that student? Uh, the other thing I will say about um, specific strategies is we have written a curriculum um, called Change Makers. And one of the things that, we, and resilience is a whole unit in there. One of the things that I know we're working on is, is pulling some of those uh, units, extracting them so, and, and offering those um, by themselves. And I know resilience is one of those. So I don't know that it's ready, but keep checking on our website and our e-store because they will be sold as modules um, and grade specific. So that might be something if you're really interested in resilience, it would give you um, three good lessons um, with the activities that go with them. Um, Tara, do you want to um, do you want to talk sure. about when to look for help? Yeah, so I know we've been talking about resilience today and and how we're all developing the skill and strength, but all of us sometimes need some extra support. So just wanted to kind of end our time together today by um, sharing some signs and signals that you might need to ask, or if you have a loved one in your life that's kind of showing these signs and signals that you might want to ask uh, support for them. And so a good question to ask yourself if you're struggling is what is what I'm going through, is it impacting my ability to live kind of as I would normally, whatever that looks like for you. So in terms of like, uh, getting up in the morning, like, is it harder for you to get out of bed? You know, you're having fatigue that makes it hard to get up in the morning. Worry, but to the point where it's taking up a significant portion of your day. Um, really kind of overwhelming feelings of apathy or hopelessness. Um, and social withdrawal, so really pulling away from the people who are important to you in your life and, and backing away from them. If you're starting to experience those things, it can be a good a sign that maybe you want to reach out to a therapist um, and ask for some more help. So I know we've all been struggling with a lot this past year. Um, and so it's normal to have a lot of emotions around that. I know we're coming up uh, this week to the anniversary of kind of when COVID began. Um, and so it's normal for that to bring up some emotions as well. Um, but just kind of keeping this in the back of your mind so you know when to reach out. And we wanted to give you um, a sense of uh, other things that we have available if it, that's helpful to you. We do have lots of additional trainings and resources. So uh, we always say, please connect to our blog because it's ever evolving. And so lots of great strategies. So the one that's shown right here is um, putting pipes, uh, beads on a pipe cleaner and it's, it's a breathing activity you can do with kids and they can uh, make this together. So lots of, uh, wonderful people, very smart people contribute to our blog, both educators and therapeutic services. So 
um, definitely encourage you to uh, become a member of our blog. Just kind of click onto that. And then um, the next one we have is, and I know you know this because you this is how you registered for this um, session, but um, keep checking back to see what um, trainings we offer. We're doing these free um, kind of answer your question things just because we want to get a lay of the land and see what's on your mind and, and see if we can be helpful in any way. But we offer also offer other more focused, deeper dive trainings. Um, and so you might want to look at that. And I know we have a few questions coming through before I um, talk about Momentous Online. Um, so I believe there'll be a recording to send out after um, our presentation. Is that correct, Rhonda? And yeah, you'll get an email and um, the recording will be available for one month. Okay. And do you know, are we also providing um, like a, a certificate or proof with that? No, uh, we're, the question? no, we don't have, we offer CEUs for our longer trainings, for our more focused trainings, but not these ones. I and, know, um, go ahead. No, go ahead, Rhonda. No, I'm just going to answer a specific uh, person's question, but no worries. I'm going to do that on chat. Okay, sounds great. Um, so I'll continue on. And so um, Momentous Online. So these are actually trainings that are already pre-recorded and available for purchase. Um, so if you want to go deeper into some of our core concepts like brain basics or self-regulation, these are available um, to purchase and then watch online. And then Rhonda mentioned as she was speaking about some of our classroom tools that are available in our shop. Um, so if you're looking at that flip the clip or um, the curriculum, I know I'm not exactly sure what's available right now in terms of curriculum, but check out our online store to see um, some additional resources. Perfect. So sorry, I was, I was um, <laughs> looking at chatting. Um, I want you to know before we um, sign off that um, you can find Tara and I um, on our website. So if you want to reach out directly, feel free to do that. Um, and we so appreciate you spending some time with us. All right. Bye all. Bye.